डॉक्टर बाबा साहेब आंबेडकर ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू दिस सीरीज ऑफ हिस्ट्री ऑफ ई एल टी इन द फर्स्ट टू प्रेजेंटेशंस वी हैव सीन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ लैंग्वेज एंड द हिस्ट्री ऑफ लैंग्वेज स्टडीज नाउ इन दिस प्रेजेंटेशन वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंग्लिश लैंग्वेज टीचिंग इन यूरोप and then we will come to english language teaching in india in the remaining two presentations okay in this presentation we are going to discuss the history of english language teaching in europe in terms of the classical period where greek and latin where the main language is being taught across europe then the modern european languages period where old and middle english was taught in britain and in other parts of uh, europe and of course uh, then we will come to how new ideas came to english language teaching during the reform period during what we call the scientific period and what is the situation today in the 21st century um in britain as well as in other countries of europe mainly while we are doing this uh i think i should draw your attention towards the fact that in the last period um in the scientific period um the history of elt in europe was as important as the history of elt in the united states of america so although the unit focuses on the history of elt in europe i think we should also keep it in mind that in recent past history of elt is broadly influenced not by the developments in britain in europe only but also by the developments in the united states of america okay so um let's come to the classical period the classical period of language teaching in europe was dominated by the teaching of latin language mainly but the greek language was equally important latin received a lot of importance because of the roman empire that was the political backbone of not only social administration social management social changes in europe but also in terms of uh, major influence over almost the entire europe the major influence of latin language greek culture along with the roman empire an equally important influence was of course the church catholic church in christianity was the predominant religious institution in europe during the classical period and all the academic activities were also governed largely by religious institutions so not only universities and training colleges but even schools were largely influenced by the church 
during the classical period. The Roman Empire was of course very powerful. <coughs> it was one of the most powerful political um, empires in the world. And from the Eurocentric point of view, of course, it was the most important, the most powerful uh, political uh, body, political unit in the history of mankind. However, we know that in other parts of the world, including India, China, um, and so on, uh, there were other political empires which were equally powerful. And in our last unit, we saw how the emergence of Sanskrit as a standardized um, vehicle of discourse in India influenced the political um, scenario of uh, the greater Indian uh, hist historical and geographical uh, areas. In terms of Roman Empire, of course, um, its influence was visible um, in large parts of Europe and also um, some parts of Asia and Africa. Because of that, the Latin language was studied in all schools even primary schools, secondary schools, and all institutions of higher learning in Europe. Thus, um, I think we have to understand that Latin language became the predominant language model for language education in Europe at that time. What was the model? the model was largely grammar translation. We have seen how Prussian, the Latin grammarian, um, created grammars based on parts of speech. That was adopted by Greek scholars also. And later, it came to be adopted by other European languages also. This grammar translation method included the teaching of rules of grammar, focusing on certain exceptions, and then exercises in translation from Latin into the European language where it was being taught. Therefore, in Britain, Latin to English and English to Latin. That was the translation model. This model came to be called the traditional method. It has been argued that this method was the prevalent method not only for the teaching of Greek and Latin in Europe, but also for teaching of Persian Arabic in the Middle East and for the teaching of Sanskrit and Pali languages as well as uh, the Chinese and Japanese languages in other parts of the world. This was therefore the classical model that was followed in the earliest times. What happened in the Middle Ages? During the Middle Ages, the Roman Empire ceased to be as powerful as it was in the classical period. Slowly, one by one, European countries became more and more independent. The kings and queens of those days started um, becoming more independent politically. And because of the uh, movements in the church, the Catholic Church, also slowly became weaker over a period of time. 
that is why modern European languages gained ground. So the teaching of Latin in the classical model required teaching of Latin grammar and translation from Latin to English, Latin to French, Latin to German, and so on. But because of this, the modern European languages also started gaining ground. As I said, politically and religiously also, European countries became more independent nationalities. And therefore, they started teaching their own languages in their schools. However, the languages were different, but the teaching method remained the same. It was the traditional method. As far as English is concerned, the Old English and Middle English grammars were codified, slowly standardization took place, and therefore the schools in Britain also came to be known as grammar schools. They were not called primary schools or secondary schools. They were called grammar schools because these were the places where people used to go to learn how to use language, how, how to master the grammar of the language. Of course, even during the Old English period and Middle English period, the hegemony of Latin grammar continued. Therefore, in these grammar schools, the students were required to learn Latin grammar. They were required to learn translation from and into Latin language. But at the same time, they started learning their own languages also and the grammars of European languages came into existence. They followed the Latin model. So the grammar of English was written on the lines of the grammar of Latin language. And wherever the English syntax differed from Latin, it was treated as an exception. English syntax or the grammatical rules of English language were not given as much of importance as the grammatical rules of Latin language were given. However, it is true that some teaching of English in the grammar schools started taking place. Then, during the reform period, there were some major changes in this model. For one thing, Latin was no longer seen as the governing principle of grammar for all languages. Other European languages also started thinking of their own grammars. Of course, what was earlier called exception was getting codified and standardization of the modern European language concerned started taking place. This is what happened with English also. What is more important is that in addition to the teaching of English in Britain, during the reform period, English was also increasingly taught in other European countries, but mainly in Germany and France. This was <coughs> Sorry, this was partly because Britain started becoming a flourishing economy with industrialization and with colonization. Britain, Germany and France, all three of them were flourishing economies and therefore 
they started taking interest in their own languages as well as the German people and the French people started taking interest in English language. Not only English language, English philosophy, English texts for science and technology also started attracting the attention of people in Germany and France. So, what sort of English language teaching was happening at that time? The most important thing is that the grammar translation method continued to be influential for some time. But along with that, language teaching materials, teaching course books came into existence. So, English was taught not merely in the form of Latin grammatical rules applied to English language. It was taught by providing lists of English words, vocabulary items, and providing structural patterns in which those words were used. And of course, the translation part remained true for modern European languages also. Therefore, in Germany, English was taught with the help of grammatical rules and sentences for translation from German into English and from English into German. Similarly, in France, English was taught with the same grammatical patterns which were identified and followed based on parts of speech model of Latin, of course. But English grammatical patterns were identified more and more. Lists of vocabulary items were produced in the teaching materials and course books. And these vocabulary items were then used in sentence patterns. Sample certain patterns which were followed by exercises in translation. So, from English to French and from French to English, translation workbooks came into existence. This was the early reform period. In the later reform period, these course books, language teaching materials, also started getting refined more and more. So, in addition to lists of words and sentences, the course books also started using pictures and picture description provided pictorial illustration of language. Now, that was followed during the last part of the reform period by what we now call the situational approach. In the situational approach, English was taught with the help of not only words and sentence patterns, but semantic groupings of vocabulary items and situational grouping of sentence patterns. What does that mean? For example, the semantic groupings of English words around kitchen would be one lesson. Semantic grouping of English words around playground would be another lesson. Semantic grouping of English words to be used in shopping and market became yet another lesson. In short, different situations in the learner's life were taken up. Words were grouped according to the thematic, semantic situations used in that particular lesson and then sentence patterns were given for practice. Once again, 
in the same thematic and semantic area. And that became very popular towards the end of the reform period. So these various situations gave rise to language teaching model which was different from the model based on teaching of Latin grammar. We can see the movement across the reform period from the hegemony of Latin language, Latin grammar, dominating language education in English also to slowly emergence of language teaching materials which were independent, which focused on English language and which focused on the things learners wanted to do using English language in various situations. Okay, the reform period was then followed by what we now call the scientific period. The scientific period started roughly at the beginning of the 20th century. It started with the emergence of phonetics and describing the spoken language. <clears throat> Let us be clear about this. Till this period, language was considered written language. Language education focused on the teaching of written language. Grammar was also worked out in terms of written language. For the first time during the scientific period, the spoken language came into focus. So, the description of the spoken language in a scientific manner happened by identifying the various language sounds or phones as they are called. And the science of phones was called phonetics. Phonetics created the ground for new types of language learning materials. Instead of depending heavily on rules of grammar, now language education started moving towards groups of words where certain sounds are repeated. Now this was for the first time that the spoken form of language came at the center of language education. And um, the IPA, the International Phonetic Association, created a script which was used for all the European languages. Therefore, the Roman script with which English language is written, with all the other European languages are written, was not the only basis for dividing lessons. The IPA brought about a major change in the dictionary and a major change in language teaching materials. Because of this, during the early part of the 20th century, two things happened. One was the emergence of linguistics, applied linguistics as we call it, as a predominant consideration in language teaching principles. Till that period, language education was not governed by linguistics. This period is called the scientific period because linguistics came to be seen as the science of language. That was the first part. And the second important development during the scientific period 
was the emergence of psychology of learning emergence of psychology itself earlier human mind was studied more on the basis of philosophy it was studied in terms of speculation it was studied on the basis of religious analysis of human behavior during the 20th century beginning of the 20th century psychology became a social science therefore linguistics and psychology became two predominant social sciences and apart from understanding human behavior in general the attention of psychologists was focused on the psychology of learning so they wanted to study what happens when learning takes place and of course um, different models like the pavlovian model um, came into existence where psychology started describing what happens in human mind in a scientific manner this had a great influence on teaching of english also therefore the early scientific period produced language learning materials which had for example drills so the substitution tables is one important example of a drill so using a substitution table using the insights of linguistics in identifying sentence patterns in identifying the phonetics features of english language drills were created for habit formation because habit formation was seen as the predominant psychological feature of language education and this led to the emergence of the structural approach the structural approach focused on structural patterns and repeated use of structural patterns to fix the pattern in the learner's mind this was the psychology of learning based on behaviorism the behaviorist principles required repeated use for habit formation and the structural approach thus combined linguistic insights with the psychology of learning to produce a large number of learning course books language education therefore became more scientific at that period of time one more thing that happened during the scientific period as we call it was the emergence of education technology especially in the united states of america language teaching was brought to laboratory the language lab was used more and more during the second world war and in subsequent years materials for teaching english through language laboratory came into existence now the three important things that happened during the scientific period are therefore the emergence of applied linguistics the emergence of psychology of learning and the emergence of education technology this brings us to the last part of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century these 50 years 
are very important in understanding the history of English language teaching in general. The way it was done in Europe influenced the way it came to be done in other parts of the world also. The first thing that happened during this period in the last quarter of 20th century was the emergence of communicative language teaching. Because of sociolinguistics and because of the insights that were developed in language functions and appropriate use of language, it became clear that accuracy or correctness was not the most important thing in language education or it was not at least the only important thing in language education. Therefore, the attention of language teachers was broadened and it included appropriate use of English language. Because of this, the second important thing that happened during this period was the distinction between language learning and language acquisition. Stephen Creshen, primarily working in Canada, but then working in other European countries also, pointed out that there was a major difference between the way languages are learned at home by a child and the way languages are taught at school by teachers. So the language acquisition processes were seen as more effective because when you acquire your mother tongue, you reach the level of mastery. Whereas language learning model, the way it is done in schools was seen as less effective because not only English language in Indian schools, but English language across all schools in the world, as well as, for example, French language learning in English schools rarely reaches the level of satisfaction. And in fact, it never reaches the mastery level, which language acquisition processes do effortlessly. So, the first thing that happened during the 21st century, beginning of 21st century, was CLT, communicative language teaching. And the second thing that happened was second language acquisition theory. There is a lot of interest generated by second language acquisition theory today all across the world. And the third important thing that happened during this period is the CEFR or the Common European Framework of Reference. This was something that happened in the European Union applied linguists from various European countries who were working in European languages at that time came together to try to arrive at a common model, a common frame of reference for language education. It is now called CEFR, where various functions of language are identified and descriptors are created by listing can-do statements. This is something that has, in a sense, revolutionized language education in Europe today and it has started influencing English language teaching in other parts of the world also. In any case, the international tests 
like IELTS and other standardized tests are almost all of them based on CEFR and therefore these developments communicative language teaching, second language acquisition theory and CEFR have come to change the face of ELT in Europe and in other parts of the world. Thank you. Smart, yeah, yeah,